Amen. This is the day that the Lord has made. So don't mess it up. Okay? And uh, what a great and awesome day. We get to get closer to the Lord today. Do you know everyone here is as close to the Lord as you want to be? If you feel a distance, He didn't move. And uh, that's biblical. We seek him, we will find him. We draw near to him, he will draw near to us. So we are today as close as we want to be. Do you want to get closer? It's up to us to draw near to him. And what do we have better to do? But anyway, it's good to be back to you, back with you. And uh, I had a series of dreams, four prophetic dreams last week. The dream portal was opened again for me. Anyway, and uh, I am uh, really excited about that. uh, You know, I don't want to get into that, but one of the things he said was I need to slow down in what I'm sharing with you here. Now, I want to tell you, you need to know those who labor among you. If I'm going to be laboring among you, you need to know me. You need to know my flaws, too. I'm not embarrassed to share them with you. You can help me out. Help me correct them. The Lord spoke to me and said my worst flaw was my impatience and my tendency to run ahead of him. And um, I don't want to, I want to correct that. I've been working on I believe... That was one major reason I had a stroke. It was one of the best things that could have ever happened to me to slow me down. From day one that that happened, I was just thanking the Lord because I immediately started seeing him in people and places I'd never, I would not have seen him before because I was moving too fast. Okay, so I've got to slow down and share with you this prophetic history of Moravian Falls in this congregation. I'm gonna, at the same time, I'm a teacher. Uh, I'm gonna sow some teaching, teachings in and out. They may be five minutes long, but that's all you're gonna need. It's gonna be something that I think will be meat and due season, food for you at the same time. And uh, so, but I'm gonna take my time in sharing this history because it's, your history, and when you really get the history, and it goes before us too, way before, centuries before us, I believe into many of the things that the Moravians planted. But we, uh, we want to be solidly moored to that so we can be stronger for going forward into things that are new and unique and fresh. We need both. We need a solid foundation and we need vision for the future. But the more solidly we're planted in God's purpose, the more he can give us. And I uh, wanted to acknowledge Randy Strom back here today. Randy, would you just say, uh, you know, Randy's parents planted a great work in Ukraine. How many churches they planted? About 100 churches they planted in Ukraine. Randy helped lead one of the great youth movements over there. And many of the leaders in the battle against Russia right now came up out of their youth movement. And uh, But Randy lost his mother last night. She went on to be with the Lord. He didn't lose her. We don't know exactly where she is. <laughs> but uh, it's still always hard when one of your parents, and she was a great missionary that helped start that work in Ukraine and build it. And uh, it's still hard with the family, even though we can really rejoice and celebrate our parents that go on. But Lord, we just ask you to bless the Strombach family today. Thank you so much for their mother and all that she imparted 
in this great family that you've already used so greatly. In Jesus' name, amen. So pray for any of you that have lost parents recently too. We have the comforter and he will comfort you. But uh, anyway, one of the reasons I was sharing in the prophetic history, a lot of people who have had an impact on what we become. This is a Morning Star Church, a Morning Star Church plant. I actually planted it, started it uh, when we first moved up here. And um, the I'm sharing with you things about Morning Star too, so you know the roots and the connection. But one of the things that we're fundamentally committed to is that every church has its own unique thing. You don't have to model anything after what's going on in Fort Mill or anything else, but you need to know it. And some of the things you do want to receive, they are part of what we're supposed to be here. And uh, vice versa, they need to receive things from here. Lord showed us that in the beginning. He, power, he showed us power lines between these two churches. And he said when they were disconnected, both would lose their power. Okay, so this is something that's really important to us. But one of the things about Morningstar, we're not trying to build Morningstar. We're trying to build the kingdom. And when the Lord looks down on Wilkes County, he doesn't see Morningstar as his church. He didn't see any con single congregation. He sees every church as part of his church, and we're all members of one another. And we want one of the things that we're fundamentally committed to is being open to the whole body, being connected to it as we can. When something great breaks out in another congregation, we want to go and be a part and help them as much as we can, and vice versa. We want to have a vision for what God's doing in the whole body, not just our little thing. Because we're just one part. And we want to keep that in mind. But we want to know this part. If you're supposed to be a part of this here, you need to know the whole thing. So this is a part of us trying to obey that. Know those who labor among you. Now, after me, several other people led this congregation for a while. And they imparted a lot that is still supposed to be a part of this congregation. And I'm really coming back to just kind of, you know, uh, be a reminder, remind of things that God has built here and is building here. And, uh, and what do we need to do to take the next step? But I'm not going to lead this thing. I'm going to help for a while and then... You know, I have my own assignment I've got to be committed to, but I want to be a part of this congregation. Okay. We talked about putting tables up here. And we're still talking about it. <laughs> you know, how do we do it? <laughs> we're to, we've got the tables. Okay, that's no thing. And I think he can help for a season. You will enjoy it. But one of the main things, if we're supposed to be a church the Lord wants to dwell in, we also have to be connected to one another. You cannot be bonded in Kenania Fellowship if you only look at the back of someone's head once a week. That's not how it works. We've got to get to know each other. We've got to do things. I think some of the things you're already doing are powerful, may need to take them up a notch, like the love feast and stuff like that where it's something strange, but a whole lot of the fellowship in the New Testament is around food. You know, so I think that works, and we need to do more of that, and will. That's why the kitchen is so important. Uh, thank you for those of you who've been a part of that and are helping commit this. Now, who are these guys? Oh, I'm not connected, am I? Am I up there now? Okay. Who are these characters? Now, right in the middle is a guy named Francis Frangipan. Francis, and right next to him, Reuven Daron. These were two of our early board members of Morningstar uh, Ministries, and it really did help to impart a lot. Now, Reuven 
He's Jewish. He was uh, a Jewish commando. He fought behind the Syrian lines in the Yom Kippur War. And he's the guy in the red shirt, but he, uh, he was the only one survived of his old, whole detachment. And he couldn't figure out why. You know, a lot of times people go through something like that. It's a terrible guilt thing. Well, he came over here to take some courses at the Arizona State University, and he was selling things door to door, try to pay for his, you know, tuition and all. And uh, he knocked on a guy's door who had been praying for years and years for the Lord to allow him to lead someone to the Lord. And then he got more specific. He said, Lord, I love the Jewish people. I love Israel. Help, would you allow me to lead a Jew to the Lord? Got real specific. Well, Reuben knocks on his door. And they just start talking. Tell me about yourself, whatever. And Reuben tells his story. He invites them in. They get real close. And he leads Reuben to the Lord. Okay. And it's a much better story than that when Reuben tells it. Trust me. But a uh, great man, he imparted so much, and I'm still close to Reuven. I still hear from him occasionally, and hopefully you'll get to meet him at some time. He leads tours in Israel now, and I think he is the best tour guide I've ever seen. Uh, I'm just saying. Now, Francis, Fran Japan, he wrote, I believe, the best book ever written on, on spiritual warfare called The Three Battlegrounds. It was one of three bestsellers in the, wor the, the year that, that he wrote it, three bestsellers in the whole body of Christ. I had a best, one of those bestsellers, and so did another friend, John Dawson, that same year. And, uh, but anyway, I helped Reuven write that book. Not write it, it's all his stuff, but I helped him put it together and get it publi published. Because I was, when I first met Reuven, I went, stay at his house with him for a while. And I mean, I'm Francis, I mean. Um, and he was doing these five minute radio programs. And I listened to him recording a couple of these. I said, Francis, those are awesome. And I said, You ought to write it. He said, I have written them. I write them in these daily devotionals. I started reading those. I said, Francis, this could be a, a chapter in a book. The next section could be another chapter. And that's how he put the book together that way. And we published, it, but uh, or helped him get it published. And um, still, I recommend it. If you're, every Christian should be involved in spiritual warfare. It is said of Jesus, he came to destroy the works of the devil. He prayed in his last prayer before the night before he was crucified, as you, Father, as you sent me, I have sent them. Now, we're not sent for the redemption of the world. He did all of that, all that needs to be done for redemption and restoration, reconciliation. But he did send us to finish the job of destroying the works of the devil. Every Christian should be provoked when we see a work of the devil and where we are open for the Lord to use us to tear that down. Really, a spiritual principle, if you see something, you can do it. Okay? We'll get into that some later. And uh, But that is such a great book. But another thing happened with Francis. Francis and I and uh, Mike Bickle and uh, some vineyard leaders were going around at the time doing conferences on Christian unity, okay? Um, we had great gatherings. We'd have, we wouldn't even go to a city unless a high percentage of the churches in that city would unite to, to bring us in, you know, to sponsor the meetings. So we had a good cross-section of the church in every city where we did these. And a few years ago, it was 2014, the Lord asked me, about those conferences we did. I had an all-day encounter with the Lord, and one of the things he asked me, how much unity did you leave those cities with? 
I thought we had great unity conferences. But I don't, I don't think there's any more unity than they already had. I don't know if we accomplished anything with that. And uh, you know what he said? You started with too many. He said, if there are just two or three gathered together, he will be in our midst. Didn't he say that? Now, this was a shock to me. He said, did you ever consider that I meant if you have more than two or three, I'm not going to be there? I said, Lord, never occurred to me. Never occurred to me. Well, that's, that was true with us. He said, we should have started with just two or three churches in a place. It would have been small enough where they could have really connected with each other and bonded into something with, that would proceed towards unity. And, and I think that's often our mentality. Let's get everybody together. Get the majority. You know, in a democracy where you've got to have a majority to pass a bill or whatever, we tend to think in that way. We've got to have major terms. Do you know some of the most powerful movements in history start with two people? The most powerful of all time started with 12. You know, the whole Roman Empire, still considered by many to be the most powerful empire in history, a couple of broken down, wounded, limping guys, messengers come limping into a city, and the officials of the most powerful empire in the world tremble. They shook nations when they went out two by two. I'm just saying we need to consider sometimes if we have more than we're supposed to have, we're going to lose the Lord in it. He's not even going to show up because he knows he's going to get lost in that. But if there are just two or three, we'll connect with him and with one another. I'm just saying what we've tried to do since then or build what, if you've ever been in the military, I was in the Navy, but I had to go through Marine Corps infantry training to be a part of a ground defense force. And one of the basic elements of an infantry division is fire teams that are made up of three or four people, depending on the weapons you you have. And you that's what that's your most basic connection. And I think that's where we should start is the church or anything we plant. Find two or three. Sow into them. Invest in them. Our home group should be small. We shouldn't try to make them bigger and bigger. They'll get big on their own. When the Lord shows up and his manifest presence is there, he will draw all men. But we want them drawn to him, not to us. Okay. So uh, anyway... Francis and I were buddies and did a lot of traveling together. Reuben would often come with us and other friends and all, but uh, I want to leave fruit that remains. And uh, another thing happened. Uh, we got a revelation on one of the most powerful strongholds on the earth today. Francis and I together. And we got it individually, Francis got it in Cleveland, tennis, uh, Cleveland, Ohio, when he was do, doing some meetings up there. I got it in Amsterdam in the Netherlands when I was there to speak to a group, you know, to missionaries from around Europe one time. What happened was I, my plane got in like two in the morning, two or three in the morning, and a YWAM missionary was there to pick me up. And when he was driving me back into the city, to the YWAM base, um, I looked up and saw the spirit of death over the city. Okay. I often see things like that. Okay. I wasn't going to say a word to anybody. Because I had seen the repercussions of exposing the devil prematurely. Whenever you expose him, you start breaking his power, and he will come to the earth with great wrath every time. And I'd seen the wrath that can come from that that people are not prepared for. I'm just saying. So I wasn't going to say a word to anybody, 
But the first afternoon in the meeting with all these missionaries, someone stands up, did the Lord show you the principality over this city? Yeah, I'm not going to lie, but I didn't want to tell them. I finally said, listen, I will tell you what is over this city if you will make a commitment that you will not pray against it. You're not going to try to fight it, cast it out. You cast out demons, but you've got to wrestle with principalities and powers. And that's the most intimate form of combat, and that's something we've got to be prepared for, and you don't want to do it prematurely. And if you're standing on this scripture where Jesus said, I've given you all authority and power, yeah, that's true. He has. But he's not going to release it to us fully until we're mature enough to handle it. He doesn't give that kind of authority to the babes in Christ. It's given to his church, singular, which means we've got to be united to have that kind of authority. Okay? And uh, he... You know, one can put a thousand flight to ten thousand. There's a multiplication of authority in unity. It's something we should definitely, you know, seek in uh, in every way. It was such a main thing on the Lord's heart. Well, anyway, I got them to make a commitment. You're not going to go pray against this thing, try to cast it out. What I've gone to many cities when the head intercessors and all would meet me and say, we bound the principality over this city. And that thing would show up in my room at night. i say, he got loose. What happened? <laughs> you know, it's like they're not binding him. They're kicking him in the shin and making him mad. Making, I'm just saying. But... uh. Anyway, so I got that commitment from the missionaries there. Don't go praying against principalities and powers. There's got to be a certain amount of unity. So then I finally shared with them, okay, there's spirit of death. That is the principality of the city. You would have thought I hit them with a cattle prod. You know, I shared a few things about how the spirit of death manifests in people. And man, they were jerking and shaking and... Uh, sure enough, I, I told them, it sounded crazy to them at the time, but I said, because I shared this with you, this can be great wrath against this city tonight. And uh, an unforecast storm came off the North Sea. Nobody had forecast. They said it's the worst storm in 100 years. Dozens died in Amsterdam that night. Dozens died in Scotland and other places where that storm went. And you think, well, did you stir up a storm? Storms can be demonic. That's why Jesus rebuked the storm. You don't have to accept every storm that's coming your way. And we've got to learn to stand against them. We can turn them, steer them. We can silence them, uh, calm them down like the Lord did. But the only two missionaries that got hurt that night were the two young ladies who went back to their apartment and started praying against that principality. Both of them almost died that night. Okay, I'm just saying, you know, this is serious business. And uh, I know people that, you know, presume to command angels. And, you know, Jesus didn't do that. He had authority to. He didn't do it. Not as a man. You know, we will be, we will, in the resurrection, judge angels. But now we're made lower than the angels, okay? And the immaturity and folly of trying to command angels. Jesus said, if I ask my father, will he not send legions of angels. He didn't command them like that. Don't do presumptuous things like that in prayer. Now, most of the time the Lord has, you know, how you kind of childproof your house when you have young toddlers. He's kind of childproofed his house. When the devil <laughs> is wanting to kill us for being so stupid, he says, don't touch him. You know, he covers us while we're immature. Usually, 
Sometimes he lets us take a hit. Anyway, after I saw the spirit of death, Francis, doing a conference at the same time in Cleveland, he saw the spirit of death over Cleveland, Ohio. And we both start pursuing, how did that thing get its roots and ability to take over the thing? And, you know, we presumed in Amsterdam is because of the Nazis and they'd turned so many Jews over to the Nazis and, and things like that, that. But it wasn't it. And not too long after, I had a dream where uh, I saw four they were bigger than principalities. They were called world rulers. It was like the highest level of demonic authority. And I saw four points on the earth where this, this world ruler manifested. One of them was Jerusalem. One of them was Cape Town, South Africa. One of them was Atlanta, Georgia. But, uh, and there was a fourth one. But uh, anyway, this was bigger than principality. It was bigger than spirit of death. But the spirit of death was empowered by this world ruler. That world ruler was racism. He said, it's the greatest power we're going to face at the end time is racism. Now, how would that release the power of death? Look at how much death has been released through racism. World War II was basically a racist war. And racism is one of the most evil strongholds in the world because it's based upon or founded upon two of the biggest evils of the human heart, pride or fear, and usually both where we become proud because we think we're of a certain race that is superior, that's evil. That's profoundly evil. God resists the proud, but gives his grace to the humble. It's the last thing we should ever want to, we should, and there are spirit, spiritual bigotry is the same thing, where we think we're better than others because we're part of a certain church or group or movement or something. If pride gets in through that, it's leading us down the wrong track. We become racist because we're fearful of those who are different from us. That's evil. And that's the evil that tries to bring, releases also the spirit of death and the religious spirit where we try to compel everyone else to become just like us. No, God made every snowflake different. He loves diversity. He loves uniqueness. He made every one of us different. And I tell you, that this is why one of the great evils, I think, today is the way the church is so boringly uniform. Every congregation should be different. Every congregation, and now that we can have, share some things, but we have our own identity. You have your own identity here. It's not going to be like any other. They say every leaf on every tree is different. That's how God creates. And, uh, but one of the things the Lord said, this is your, one of your personal enemies, and I believe the Lord gives us one, of battling the spirit of racism. Especially bigotry, spiritual bigotry. Okay, well, anyway, that revelation all came out of me see, seeing spirit of death over Amsterdam, Francis over Cleveland, and we did teachings and tapes on it, and uh, they got circulated throughout the NFL because so many teams were having racial problems. I had some friends on the Redskins at the time, and they invited me to speak. They wanted to hear from me. At the time, I... I had started speaking to professional teams. Uh, it was just something God led me into. In 1982, he showed me that some of his greatest leaders at the end were going to come out of professional sports. He said, that's their seminary, and they're being taught things in their seminary we don't teach in ours. 
like teamwork, how God's ministry is a team, how we've got to work together and how you, you've got to become a team. One of the greatest teachers on team, by the way, is Mike Godfrey to here today, but he lives up here now. And Dave's known him longer than I have. From, But he was one of the great college coaches, football coaches. And, um, of course, he, he hosted the ESPN show on college football for almost 20 years, I think 19 years. But you'd know Mike if you saw him. He's been battling some things. and he's, uh, But he is one of the great teachers. We had our master's course on leadership. We had him teach. I had different leaders from different fields teaching it. But his stuff on football, on building a football team, I said, everybody needs to hear this. And we've got to apply it. Okay, and that's how, you know, there are many ways we need to not worship professional sports or any kind of sports. And we can be too focused on it. Our highs and lows can be dependent on how our team does, whatever. That's wrong. Okay, we should have a bigger vision than that, bigger purpose in our life. But you can learn a lot. And I tell you, I learned tons from the times I spoke to these professional teams and got to eat their team dinners with them and get to know some of them and all. And uh, many of them became a part of Morningstar. We built our first lodge up there with a ministry called Cause, Christians United for Spiritual Empowered, Empowerment. And they were mostly uh, NFL and NBA players, some of which wanted to move here. They never did, but you would know their names. They were all, all, all pros and all. But uh, anyway... We're still in touch with a lot of professional athletes. We'll continue to be because we're looking for future leaders. And God said some of his best were going to come out of there. Okay, we'll get into more of this later. Here's Ricky Skaggs and Francis on my front porch. Ricky's been a big part. He has been a member of the board of Morningstar since 1988. And uh, had a huge impact on us. And he... You know, of course, has introduced us to many other entertainers and and all, and um, and we have a ministry to professional entertainers also. Uh, they know Morningstar. Here's Dudley Hall. He was a early board member, and John Hamrick in the background. Uh, uh, Bob Mumford. There's Mike Bickle and Reuven. Now, I know Mike has gone through some real troubles. Some things have been manifested. I don't care. I'm not going to deny that. He's been one of our great friends, been a great part of this. And you know, how many of you still read King David's Psalms? <laughs> yeah, didn't he? he did something way worse than Mike. Way worse. And, uh, you know, we don't give up on anybody when they mess up. I don't care how bad. Galatians 6, 1 says, if a man is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one. And restoring is a whole lot more than just forgiving them. That's getting them back in the place they had. Mike helped start what may be the greatest prayer movement in church history. And it's still going strong. It hadn't missed a beat. Since all this happened with Mike, they've had a lot of controversy and confusion, but they are still going strong, which tells me Mike really helped to plant a solid foundation for that work. Okay, and you're going to hear from Mike again. He's going to be better than ever. I'm just saying, don't give up on Mike Bickle. Yeah, that was some crazy stuff. And, uh, but we're going to obey that scripture, restore and it says, do it in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you too be tempted. Okay, so we don't throw people away. These are God's kids. All right. Now, here's a picture you won't see often. It's Reggie White on a horse. It's one of my horses. 
we used to have right there at the box house on just off Price Road. I thought Reggie was going to break that poor horse's back. <laughs> Reggie's playing weight was 315. He had less than, I think it was less than 1% body fat. He was a monster. He was the fastest guy on the team for 20 yards. He could outrun the running backs for 20 yards. That's why he was such a, a great pass rusher and all. But uh, anyway, we Reggie was a major part. We were best friends, used to travel in the offseason. I'd go up there and endure some of those real cold games up at Green Bay. and uh, But, you know, he, he and some of the, the guys, Reggie helped lead to the Lord in the NFL, were a big part of Morningstar and help us in our foundation. We want to keep those links and those road, inroads helping people in sports. Okay? And we want to learn from them. Here's the first house I bought up here. And uh, that's where I got most of the revelation I wrote about in the Final Quest. It's on Price Road. One day we were sitting in there. You know how fog comes up the mountain? And uh, almost every morning you can see fog down the valley, but we're above the fog. And then it rises as the temperature rises and comes up. And we were in this big fog sitting in that sunroom one day when Paul Cain had... He had bought that cabin from me. And Paul was, uh, we were all sitting in there, Bart Peacher, myself, I think Randy, you were in there. And <laughs> this is funny. Paul used to have angelic visitations all the time, and they would scare him badly. And we were sitting in there just talking in this fog, and he looks out the window and he goes, Oh no, here comes the spirit of death. <laughs> and Bart looks out and he goes, no, that's my wife, Carolyn. <laughs> she was wa walking up out of the fog with this hood on. <laughs> and she did kind of look at me. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> Here's Ricky blowing the shofar. That's, this is Prayer Mountain when we first got that land. Uh, here's a picture of us at a ranch in Texas. Jack Deere, Mike Bickle, myself, in the middle of Paul Kane and John Wimber. Uh, I never was a part of the vineyard. The vineyard was never a part of Morningstar except as friends. We have a lot of vineyard people visit us in our churches and vice versa. I used to speak for John sometimes in his uh, conferences or at his church in Anaheim. And, uh, but John and I used to fight a lot. I don't know why we just didn't get along to, but John, I'm the only one he and Carol ever asked to stay with them in their own home. And we fought the whole several days. <laughs> But, uh, I w and I tell you, most of the fighting was my fault. I was being obnoxious, <laughs> prideful, whatever. And uh, John, bless his heart, he, he put up with me forever. But I ended up, I introduced him to Leonard Ravenhill, who I really was wanting to sell tickets to the fight because I didn't think they would get along at all. They're the, such opposites. And uh, so... Anyway, we all went to lunch together. Mike Bickle joined it. And uh, I thought this is really going to be something to see. Those two, they're opposites. And they immediately became like long lost brothers. I couldn't believe how much they enjoyed each other's company and just loved each other. And now, Ravenhill was the author of Why Revival Terror Terries and all. Some of the greatest but hardest books, you know, on the church and things. But they were so loose. John used to preach in his gym shorts. And while we're at lunch that day, John invites Ravenhill to come to Anaheim and speak. Well, a lot of the people come off the beach into church. They're wearing bikinis and, 
You can't believe it. I mean, this is California. California. <laughs> you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, I told you last week about how many demons used to manifest in the meetings there. It's because it's California. <laughs> you know, the, where the demons go. <laughs> I'm just saying, uh, uh, we love California, but uh, anyway, I said, if Raven Hill's going to speak at the Anaheim Vineyard, I've got to see this. I have got to go. I flew out there to watch him and, you know, uh, got on the front row, a little bit off to the side so I could see what's going on. And I saw all the bikinis out there that were barely, could barely be characterized as a bikini. And I knew Raven Hill. He was a holiness preacher. And uh, anyway, I thought he, Raven Hill is going to tear them up. He is going to rip them to shreds. He did not say one thing about it. I was shocked. He started preaching Jesus. Nothing about holiness, about holiness standards or anything. He preached Jesus. After just a few minutes, I watched people trying to cover themselves up. And then within 15 minutes, people were falling out of their chairs onto the floor and wailing under conviction. And... Uh, it was an incredible encounter. And he went on. We had conferences with Raven Hill in the vineyard. And I think he had a huge impact on the vineyard and vice versa. Uh, but you'll be hearing more about that. That is a part of our history. And I'm, I'm thankful for it. I'm so thankful for the vineyard. It's not anything like it now like it was then. But we had some of the most incredible miracles I've ever seen. And for a period of time, John Wimber was probably the most sought after speaker in the worldwide body of Christ. And it was even claimed to have had more influence than anyone else in the body of Christ for a time. And he was a remarkable man. He was honest. He shared his mistakes, his flaws. He had plenty of them, like we all. And, uh, but God just came in power when Wimber or the vineyard and everybody in the vineyard could lead people to the Lord. They could disciple them. They could cast out demons and heal the sick. Everybody. He equipped the saints to do the work of the ministry better than anyone I'd ever encountered. And all of his people were that way. And I've, I've visited at that time. John asked me to visit as many churches of their vineyard churches as I could. And I did. I went around and they were all unique and different in a lot of ways. But they all had power. We have to have that power. Okay. I tell you, there are a lot of demons that are not being cast out that need to be cast out. But we don't want to focus on you. The vineyard people had the most authority over demons over anyone I'd ever met except Bob Jones. When they didn't, when they faced something or ran into something they couldn't deal with, they would call Bob. And Bob could deal with it in a minute, instantly. Um, but anyway, um, I'm thankful for those times. I'm thankful for that. But we've got to get back to that too. Healing the sick where everybody can do it and quick is quick to do it. And recognize, discern when it's a demonic problem and get rid of it and not make a big deal out of it. None of the vineyard people made a big deal out of it. I shared with you last week about how that young little girl, five foot tall girl, jumped on this giant that I think had legion. Cast legion or whatever was in him. And this guy was possessed. And she cast it out of him in a minute had him sitting up and sitting in a chair in his right mind. It was astonishing. Anybody in the vineyard could have done that. I, or just about. Okay, we need that. Okay, another one. 
this guy I'm with, I'm standing on Hitler's bunker in Berlin with Colonel Eugene Byrd, who was, became the foremost authority on Nazi Germany. Before he died, he was considered worldwide the foremost authority. Now, uh, Byrd also, I think, was one of the most uh, Christ-like people I've ever met. And uh, he used to do these incredible tours for our youth groups. I would take him over there. He would take him on a three-day tour that uh, would change lives remarkably. But Byrd was one of our elite soldiers in World War II. He was, if you've ever seen the movie of the Remagen Bridge, uh, where we took that bridge the Nazis were trying to blow up, we took it, a, a company, American company, took it before the Nazis could blow it up and allowed our armies to cross the Rhine and probably shorten the war by weeks, if not months. Well, that was Byrd's company. He was one of the first to cross the Remagen Bridge and he was the first American soldier into Berlin after the Russians had captured it. And Byrd told me that he, he would pray every single day during that war for the Lord to keep him alive for one more day so he could kill more Nazis. He said that's how much he hated them. His prayer was to kill. And he was one of our best soldiers. And... Uh, but he gets to Berlin. I'll tell you the story later. It's really important that we get this, that we understand its uh, connection to racism and a lot of other things. He gets to Berlin. He's American representative uh, with the French, the British, and the Russians who are all trying to decide what to do with these survivors in Berlin. Their engineers had said it would take something like 300 boxcars a day, 30 years, just to carry the rubble out. So they had decided they could not uh, rebuild Berlin. And uh, Byrd said these women told them, they were about the only ones left in Berlin because all the young males, old men, everybody had been put in the army and had died, you know, in the battle. Russia lost more men taking Berlin than America lost in the whole war, including the war against Japan. That's the kind of battle that city suffered. And these women, afterwards, Stalin gave the Russian army, he said, whichever army plants its flag on the Reichstag, which is their parliament, he was going to give them three days to do whatever they wanted to do to the German people as their reward. And you can imagine what they did. And uh, he had two armies trying to take Berlin, and he said the one that gets here first will have this. And, of course, the, the women, the young girls were raped dozens of times, sometimes a day. And it was just the most horrible... They were tortured, many times killed, because he said you can do anything you want to them. Can you imagine what, what that would be like to be one of those women of Berlin at that time? They were about the only ones left. It was almost all women. And they had been through two years of the worst hell you can imagine, day and night bombing. How would you like to have bombs falling on your city every day for two years? Day and night, no rest. And if anybody had been through hell on earth, it was them. After three days, the Russians could not get their troops under control. It went on for two weeks before they started having to shoot their own men to stop them, put a stop to that. And that's, this is what those women had just lived through. So Bird and the other guys are deciding we can't rebuild the city. We've just moved these survivors to another city. And the women spoke up and said, we're not going to leave our city. We will rebuild it. We will restore it. You know, if you take the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two, everything in between those chapters is about one subject. 
restoration. We really need to get how much that is God's heart. We don't throw people out. We, we don't throw anybody out because they made mistakes or have problems or whatever. We've got to restore them. He's going to restore the earth to the paradise it was originally created to be. That's scripture. He's not going to leave us in this condition, and we have to have that fundamental heart. With those women said, we will rebuild our city. And they're all going, you're crazy. You can't, this is impossible. We can't do it with our armies. How are you going to do it? Bird said next morning he woke up. He heard a sound he'd never heard before. So he went outside to see what was going on. It was lines of women picking up the bricks, putting them in cans and trying to cart them off. They were already working at restoring their city. After all they had been through, they had that kind of resilience in them. And Bird said all that hatred he had in him for the German people, for the Nazis, he said changed right then to the most incredible respect. And he prayed a prayer right then. He said, ask the Lord to send him back to Germany so he can help them rebuild their nation. And he was sent back as the American commandant of the Spandau prison that housed all the Nazi war criminals. Bird is the one who wrote the book, The Loneliest Man in the World, about Rudolf Hess, which he got Rudolf Hess to initial every page. And uh, he, uh, you know, I'll, I'll tell you other things about Bird, but he came back to help him, and he ended up with some others leading all the Nazi the top Nazis, Rudolf Hess, Albert Speer, the greatest, you know, he was the armaments uh, minister. He, uh, the others, von Schirach, who was head of the Nazi youth, who started the Nazi youth, uh, he led all of them to the Lord. You're going to have Nazis with you in heaven. Some of the worst Nazis. Now get ready, that's God's heart. You know, as deep as the devil can get into someone, that's how deep the Lord can fill them when he's gotten out. We've got to start looking at people that way. And every time I go over there to Berlin, he would introduce me to a lot of these old Nazis who had done. I couldn't believe what sweet, nice, godly people they were. And um, God is able to do that. I just submit that when we see people doing evil, who are evil, that we not condemn. We pray for that heart of restoration and for a way to help them restore. Now, Bird became really famous in Germany because he would never say, he would not even talk about Hitler without saying something good about him. Now, you think, what could you say good? There was a lot. Do you know both Hitler and Stalin tried to become priests? What would have happened? How would world history changed if the church had let them in? Now, I'm not blaming the church because maybe the church just had discernment and said, we aren't letting these guys in, you know. That could be it. But anyway, here we are on Hitler's bunker. We're standing on that bunker. That's where Hitler killed himself with probably the foremost authority in Nazi Germany. Here's this neo-Nazi. Now, this is right after the wall came down. We were some of the first to know where the bunker was and get there. And here's a neo-Nazi who was, showed up and starts lecturing Colonel Byrd, the foremost authority in the world, what this is, what it means. Everything. Every time Byrd would share something with Paul or I, this guy would say, oh, no, it didn't happen like that. And I, it was really funny, comical. This is where the Cold War started. This is the Potsdam Conference Center where Stalin, Truman, Churchill, and uh, who else met there? But those three were the main ones. That, uh, And that's where Truman told them about Churchill and Stalin that they had had the bomb. And Stalin right then called over some of his people and start, said, 
start working on that. We got to have the bomb. That's, this is where the Cold War started. I'm just saying that's Bird in the Middle lecturing uh, Gary Keller and Andreas Keller, who used to live on, have a place on the mountain here. You may have met them. That's inside the courtyard there. This is the Wansi house. Bird had this, when he uh, had the authority, he had, they were about to burn this place down because this is, this is the house where the Nazis formulated the final solution to kill all the Jews. Okay, and they were going to destroy it, and Bird made them uh, preserve it as a monument to the evil that had happened there. He said, we can't forget this stuff. And, uh, but anyway, here is the final solution that all the top Nazis met right there and signed this final solution to kill all the Nazis in Europe. What this is, is a budget. Every one of those papers represents a country and the estimate of how much it would cost to kill all the Jews in that country. We can't ever forget this kind of stuff. Guess what? The same spirit is trying to get into the U.S. It's not coming as a Nazi, but it is racist. It is racism. We've got to really grip that. Here, it's interesting. This is one of the early trips. There's Susie Urari right there. See her looking back at you. And uh, one of these tours with Bird. Here we are. Uh, we did a conference in the Sudstern Church, which was uh, the Kaiser's Church. And Peter Dippel, the pastor of that church, the, the government of Germany sold it to him for a dollar. If he would restore it, it was heavily damaged in the war. He said he, the agreement was he had to restore it, and then he had to open it so many hours a week for tourists and all. It had the Kaiser's throne in there, gilded in gold. I said, Peter, you paid a dollar for this? He said, one dollar. I said, I'll give you a dollar fifty right now. <laughs> <laughs> See this? This is mentioned in the book of Revelation. This is Satan's throne. The uh, church of Pergamum. He says, I know you dwell where Satan's throne is. This had, they had, the Germans had excavated it from Pergamum, which was in modern day Iraq, and brought it to Berlin. This was an altar to Baal where they did human sacrifices. And the year they brought this in was the same year the Nazis took over in Germany. I tell you, there are things they can open the gates of hell, that hell will come through into our land. We're called to shut those gates of hell, not open them. But most Germans won't even go in that museum. It's called the Bergamon Museum. It was one of the top museums in, in Europe. But uh, we took our tours there for those who could endure it. It was so demonic. You know, statues and all, you would feel like they were alive. You, you would feel like their eyes were following you in there. It was so evil. But we just felt, you know, we've got to face these things. We can't be afraid of them. We've got one much bigger living inside of us. All right, here's a little presentation of the gates of Babylon. They had ex excavated the gates of Babylon. It was in the same museum. This is considered to be the door that Daniel walked through. Nebuchadnezzar supposedly put his statue right on the other side of this gate, and um, but anyway, I, I'm not just trying to entertain you. We want to go a little bit deeper. You know, to have authority, you need knowledge. You need to know what you're doing. We need to go deeper into the spirit of racism. And fundamentally, I think you will deal with the racism in your own heart if you would just grasp God resists the proud. 
I think it'd be better to have all the demons in hell chasing you than God resisting you. And he gives his grace to the humble. Listen, there is no treasure on earth close to as valuable as the grace of God in our life. The favor of God in our life. And if we grasp this, you know what we're going to be doing? We're going to be spending more time trying to humble ourselves. We won't go into a conversation trying to project ourselves as being so great and powerful and the great things we're done. We're going to be going into them, how do we humble ourselves? We're going to let others speak. We're going to be open to what God's doing with them. And then we're open to prophecies that can help them along the way to accomplishing what they're called to do. I tell you, a key to everything we're trying to walk in as Christians is walking in true humility. Let me tell you what it is not. This thing where, oh, I'm so unworthy. That's false humility. That's pride. That's what the Lord rebuked Moses for at the burning bush. Remember, Moses said, Lord, I'm not worthy. I can't speak. And it says the anger of the Lord burned against him. I mean, we think that sounds really humble and he's just, no, what he was saying, God himself said, I'm going to use you this way. And we were saying, Lord, you don't know what you're doing. My inabilities, my flaws and my the weakness of my flesh is stronger than the strength of your spirit. Do you see what the pride that is? None of us are worthy. We need to settle that right down. None of us are smart enough, wise enough, righteous enough. That just isn't going to work. But it, to walk in true humility too, you're not going to be walking around downcasts. Because you're going to be a new creature. But your confidence is going to be in what God has made you, not what you've made yourself of, what you are. Do you get it? And we need His grace. We can't accomplish anything we're called to do without His grace. Nothing. We've got to get in touch with the power of His blood. The power of His cross. I just submit to you, there's no one on earth right now walking in the full power of the cross and what he paid such a price for us to have and walk in. We've got to grow up into that. And uh, when we do, there's no demon, no devil, or anything else going to concern us or going to make us fear. If you have the true and holy fear of God, you don't have to fear anything else on earth. but it comes through humility. God gives his grace to the humble. So I'm just saying, I hope you're getting to some of these and get a grip on this racism. And Lord, I just ask you right now, for every one of these that were so hungry, they would get up this early, even when we lost so much sleep last night. And, but uh, Lord, that they were so hungry, they would come here seeking to hear anything from you. Lord, I just ask for any seeds that you used me to plant this morning, that you would water them. Lord, that you would watch over them, that you would put, put books in our hands that would fortify these truths and, and help us to understand them better. That you would be our teacher and you would be our shepherd. And Lord, I ask you for every one of these. I ask you to give us that revelation of what it really means to resist the proud and give your grace to the humble. Lord, help us. Help us. We can't do it on our own. We're a prideful, wayward people. We're an Im I'm an impatient person. I know you. I still am in many ways. Lord, I ask for help. You showed me this week I'm still so impatient. But Lord, help. We ask for the helper. You sent the helper, one of the greatest gifts. 
After the cross, there's no gift we could ever, ever have more valuable than your Holy Spirit. I ask for the Holy Spirit in the lives of everyone here that we would have the first thing when we wake up in the morning, Lord, we would know you. We would sense you and your purpose and have as our main thing that day, we're going to get closer. We're going to love you more. We're going to love your people more. And we're going to grow in the grace that you've given to all of us that is readily available if we will seek it. Help us, Lord. Send the helper to help us. In Jesus' name, amen.